Greetings, fellow scholars of the livestream. I'm Kudakuma from the Cosmo Canyon Observatory, and today we are continuing the analysis of all new elements pertaining to Cloud and Sephiroth in the Final Fantasy VII Remake first installment. We highly recommend that you watch all the previous parts visible on screen before continuing, just so you can receive the full context. You can find the continuously growing playlist in the info card up there. Still here? Fantastic! Strap in and enjoy the next segment of our journey. Caution, spoilers ahead. Why and how does Sephiroth appear in the Midgar Arc already? First of all, any appearance before entering the Shinra building, barring one flashback, can be classified as a hallucination, only visible to Cloud, so he's not actually there. However, he never appeared to Cloud like this in the original telling of the story, so what's going on? As we learned in the Livestream Black chapters, Sephiroth made Cloud, or rather Cloud's memories of him, his spirit core, his anchor to existence, to prevent dissipation into the Livestream. In Advent Children, the only way for Sephiroth to connect to Cloud was through Geostigma. By giving Cloud the black mark, Cloud would hold a constant reminder of Sephiroth's continuing existence, along with seeing that mark spreading all over the planet. However, he was not able to appear to Cloud as a hallucination, as Cloud was still in the world of the living. But, according to our theory of this retelling happening in the livestream's memories, it would be possible for Sephiroth to inject himself into Cloud's memory version and thus appear to him that way. Still, he cannot do that willy-nilly. According to our observations, Sephiroth is only able to actively appear before Cloud as a hallucination right after a flashback triggered by another event in the story. This heavily implies that Sephiroth needs an open memory pathway of sorts to actually connect to Cloud's consciousness, which is only granted when Cloud remembers a traumatic event tied to Sephiroth. But why does this restriction even exist? After being defeated by Cloud a third time in Advent Children, Aerith and the planet might have trapped his essence in the corrupted or stagnant part of the livestream. Without the ability to freely roam the whole livestream, he's only able to mind call Cloud through their still existing connection. As long as Cloud remembers him, he will never cease to exist. But why does he need to do all of this? To change history and remake the future, in order to prepare and execute his ultimate plan to finally achieve his goal. But that is for another video. At first, it seems like he wants Cloud to go on his fated journey alone, which consists of the reunion pilgrimage, retrieving the black materia, and bringing it to Sephiroth's reborn body in the northern crater. By making Cloud take the detour in Chapter 2, he hopes for him to miss Aerith. As this fails, he tries to discourage Cloud, but Aerith's interference thwarts that as well. Still, corrupting Cloud and making him sleep in made sure that he didn't become a part of the second bombing mission. But that's where the Whisper conflict towards the end of Chapter 4 kicks off. Even with some control over the Whispers, Sephiroth still fails to change the timeline, and Cloud is welcomed back into Avalanche and thus meets Aerith again. That's why... Oh, Cloud. There's still so much to be done. Now, with Aerith in the game again, he can only try and keep Cloud's hatred and fear alive. However, this also leads to nowhere, thanks to Cloud's friends. So the only way to ensure another go at victory is to get rid of fate itself. So he invites Cloud to join him to defeat destiny together. But again, his friends join him, made possible by Aerith changing the portal. Without her interference, it's possible that after Cloud entered the portal, it would have closed immediately after him. Though he might have anticipated the others following Cloud anyway. Still, The way he treats the others, it seems like he's only interested in Cloud alone. In any case, he makes sure Cloud's gang defeats the forces holding him prisoner, 
and then manipulates them into defeating the forces of destiny altogether, allowing him to form a new future. Eventually, he tries to bring Cloud over to his side, so they can defy destiny together. With Cloud on his side, Cloud would not be in the position to defeat him anymore, circumventing the problem altogether. Is it always the same Sephiroth, or are there multiple ones? Technically, only one Sephiroth exists, just not from the same point in the Final Fantasy VII timeline. There are also multiple types of appearances, which can be put into individual categories. We've talked about Illusion Sephiroth extensively, but there are three more types of appearances. Flashback, Black Robe, and Unknown, so four in total, according to the Altamania's categorization at least. Its explanation is a bit vague, purposely, so not to reveal the mystery, which is why we'll only use it as a basis for our categorization and explanation to stay in canon. If you're interested, you can find the link to a well-done translation by I, Stanley FF7, which includes all Sephiroth appearances in the description below. To get a better grasp on all Sephiroth appearances, we created our own categorization and came up with six distinct types of appearances. Connection, Hallucination, Flashback, Whispers, Black-robed Figure, and Negative Livestream. What do those mean and entail? Connections describes the essence of future Sephiroth, which connects to Cloud and appears to him as an illusion. Hallucinations happen merely in Cloud's mind, caused by Genova cells or his own PTSD without outside influence. Flashbacks are purely memories of Sephiroth triggered by association. Appearances labeled as whispers stand for whispers being remote controlled by Sephiroth, aka the enigmatic specter. Black robed figure appearances describe images of Sephiroth superimposed over a black robed figure, visible to everyone. The negative life stream appearance is exclusive to chapter 18 and describes Sephiroth's body, which is composed of negative life stream essence. To better visualize those categories, let's speed through all relevant scenes. Connections happen when Sephiroth lures Cloud into the alleyway to inflame his hatred, when he freezes Aerith in place to tell Cloud that he cannot save anyone. After Cloud falls into the church and he tells him that there's still so much to be done. And after the plate falls to tell Cloud that he has failed yet again. We experience hallucinations when Cloud mistakes Marco, number 49, as Sephiroth. Again, when he sees number 2 as Sephiroth after being touched. After the regular Cosmos Theater presentation, when it glitches out. And at the end of the highway, before Cloud hits the brakes and sees the third feather. Flashbacks happen when Cloud remembers Sephiroth claiming he's an ancient after the plate falls during his reunion walk towards the elevator, and on the bridge to Genova's tank when he remembers Sephiroth talking to Genova. Sephiroth controls whispers on three occasions, at night in chapter four to make Cloud sleep in, on the next day to keep Cloud away from Avalanche, and on the Sector 7 train station plaza to slow down the group. The most appearances happen as a black robed figure while walking by Palmer, in front of Genova's tank, slicing the bridge, on one of Hojo's monitors carrying Genova away, killing the president and Barrett and turning into Genova Dreamweaver, picking up Genova's body as number two, and before releasing control over number two on the roof. The negative livestream version makes only three appearances, at the end of the highway, appearing to everyone and creating the portal. After the victory over Whisper Harbinger to fight the group. And at the edge of creation, trying to win Cloud over to his side. How does Sephiroth gain control over the Whispers? He's jailed within Whisper Harbinger and within the negative life stream, at least according to our current theories. Sephiroth also still has a connection to Cloud. If Cloud remembers him, he's able to come back. 
Whenever Cloud has a PTSD episode with memories connected to Sephiroth, he's able to connect to Cloud and appear before him, causing Cloud to remember him and increase his power and influence. This is only possible because the Cloud in this game is part of the planet's memory, to which Sephiroth usually has access to, as he points out in the original game. I became a traveler of the livestream and gained the knowledge and wisdom of the ancients. I also gained the knowledge and wisdom of those after the extinction of the ancients. With this connection to Cloud, he's able to slowly increase his influence over Whisper Harbinger and, by proxy, also some of the Whispers. But only where a lot of Whispers are already standing by to counteract change. We can see this in chapters 4 and 12, where we have to fight one enigmatic specter in two separate fights, a purple whisper with control over other whispers. As soon as we defeat the purple whisper, the battle ends, and the other whispers are set free. Until then, the purple whisper can summon more whispers indefinitely. The very first battle does not include a purple whisper, but the whole whisper debacle also does not end until we overcome the second battle. Sephiroth is also able to force Cloud into a deep slumber as his first attempt of controlling Whispers. As an aside, the Whispers depiction is most likely influenced by Sephiroth's and Genova's connection to them, and the corruption of the part of the livestream they're imprisoned in. The Whispers' appearance is too similar to the black-robed people in the original game, even down to their artwork, for this to be a mere coincidence. In Chapter 18, with such an abundance of Whispers preparing the Midgard Dome, it's even possible for Sephiroth to project himself in front of everyone. He does not attack, because he probably can't. He's just a projection. The Reign of Black Feathers would then be a mere side effect of his projection being initiated. In the battle against Whisper Harbinger, Sephiroth's influence over, and possibly even corruption of it, as seen by the color purple, might compel it to summon Sephiroth's remnants as avatars representing protectors of a future where they will come into being, in order to stop those who seek to defy destiny, the planet's memory. Compared to mere future representations of our party members, as one might mistake them for, the Advent Children are in actual danger of ceasing to exist if we defy destiny and change the future. There is also another detail which points towards a corruption by Genova. The fine mesh protruding from Genova's body in the tank can be found on the Harbinger's head. This is too specific to be a coincidence. Furthermore, the carvings on its head shell form a gap for a single eye, the left one through which its purple brain emits a purple glow, just like Genova does in Crisis Core in the original game. The same goes for Whisper Rubrum, v Reedy, and Crocale, just with different colors. Thanks to Sleep Easy for this find. After the party defeats Whisper Harbinger, shattering its heart, which is Sephiroth's prison, the latter is completely free and can do whatever he pleases with the Whispers. What's the color purple about? It's mainly a symbol for anything bad for life in the planet. A destructive force, so to speak. Some examples would be Sephiroth, Genova, Shinra, you name it. It therefore also represents corruption and parasitic behavior. Anything draining away the planet's life force or extinguishing it. However, it's also used to symbolize negative emotions, like fear, or even a counterbalance to yellow. Which is used to signify the opposite. Life, protection, creation, or positive emotions like comfort. Yellow is not nearly as prevalent and mostly used to provide contrast. This imbalance itself can be considered a hint towards the planet's current state. Not good. <laughs> Before we get into it, huge thanks to Sleep Easy again for doing the groundwork on this subject. Now, let's go through all relevant occurrences of the color purple. Spoilers, <laughs> there's a lot. And the color purple has its first appearance in the intro cinematic, both involving Aerith. 
The purple light down the alley frightens her and causes her to flee. At the same time, one of the yellow light bulb flickers, signifying danger of corruption. Outside, another purple light on the ground grabs Aerith's attention, which eventually leads to one of her yellow flowers being stepped on, another purple entity causing a yellow entity to suffer. One of the vans passing by in the blurry background while Aerith picks up the flower is also cast in a purple light, and so is another part of the street further south below the large Studio White sign. It seems like corruption is slowly spreading within a peaceful place, represented by a myriad of yellow lights in the rest of Midgar, as we don't see any other purple light sources during the rest of this intro. The Benora White poster containing a purple dumb apple is also quite suspicious, especially since it appears all over the place. It's Genesis. There's no escape. He's everywhere. President Shinra is the only one at the company wearing a suit with a purple hue. He's the king parasite after all, slurping up all the Mako. Slurping it up like a thirsty dog. His original design displayed his outfit in an auburn color, so this change was deliberate. Some of Smogger's poisonous and silencing attacks, which stick to the ground, also bear the purple color. Those look very toxic and very unhealthy for soil and plants. It's also worth noting that Wall Market oozes with purple lights. Maybe it's merely a design choice, but it's also thematically fitting. Independence, chaos, consumerism, degeneracy, and no regard to life in general. In chapter 11, many of the ghostly finger paintings are purple. The ghosts in the train graveyard are trapped and corrupted by Elagor, plagued by loneliness, fear, and sadness. Their inability to return to the life stream disrupts the cycle of life and is thus bad for the planet. The painting on the sad ghost's back presumably shows Elagor corrupting and controlling a ghost, which is illustrated as this purple effect around the ladder. The Shinra building contains only a few elements cast in purple, even though it represents the heart of what's presented as the planet's worst enemy. Besides elements connected to Sephiroth and Genova, as we'll see later. Interestingly, the only purple elements are light sources found in either key locations for, or the goal of Operation Save Aerith. The information desks in the lobby and the reception desk on floor 59, where we receive the key cards, as well as all over the structures Tifa needs to hop over or climb across to reach the first key card. The test subject tank where Aerith is being held in receives the only purple light source in the whole laboratory complex. Not even Red 13's tank has one, which lies directly underneath. Nor the drum, besides Genova's tank. Only green, blue, and the occasional red. That's it for the building interior. However, there's more. During the phenomenal presentation in the Cosmos Theater, we can spot countless purple flowers growing on the fields alongside white and yellow ones, the perfect balance between order and chaos. Just like the yellow and purple materia floating by. While other balls also fly around, those two specific colors receive a purposeful focus, though the yellow command materia is shown a bit longer and closer. Later in the same presentation, we see Genova's meteor flying towards the planet, a bright yellow shooting star with a purple trail. Pretending to be good in the front, while well, its corruptive nature is trailing behind? Right after, Sephiroth's part of the presentation begins with purple glitches, which show up again when more elements appear, like the fleeing crowd, or when the hooded figure or the image of Sephiroth itself teleports. Before taking the elevator to the drum, we get to see through the unknown entity's eyes for a few seconds where everything is covered in a purple haze. That's what a high concentration of Genova cells in your body does to you. Inside Genova's tank sits a purple light source glowing from below and a green one shining from above. 
presenting Genova in this eerie duality of Mako green and corrupted purple. Life from above, death from below. The polar opposite of the tragic event at the heart of the Forgotten City. After Sephiroth takes Genova away, we follow a purple trail of goo, which looks quite alive, as if it tries to corrupt everything it touches. In President Shinner's office, Sephiroth engulfs himself in purple mist to transform into Genova Dreamweaver. Within the battle, it summons countless tentacles, which appear from portals emanating purple particles. Purple vortexes inflict stop, and Genova occasionally teleports, leaving purple smoke behind. Beating Genova transforms the area back into the president's office, and through purple mist, number 49 is revealed and dies, dispersing into purple smoke and particles. Genova's body appears the same way. The backside of Rufus's coins depict purple mandrake, or mandragora flowers, in addition to his dear dog Darkstar. These flowers symbolize fear, a negative emotion, according to the Ultimania. Chapter 18 is full of purple colors. Sephiroth's portal, lightning, tornadoes, and other weather effects in the singularity. Whisper Harbinger's main color is also purple, especially its heart and brain. Its three minions appear and disappear through purple smoke. And to defeat Whisper Harbinger for good, we need to shatter its purple heart. Negative livestream energy then gathers in a single spot, which glows purple. During the battle against Sephiroth, his sword sometimes glows purple, or even emits purple particles. Before the third party member appears, he traps Cloud and his first ally in a purple circle. His sword also glows in the same color in that scene. At the edge of creation, Sephiroth's sword swings leave purple streaks in its wake. And during the ending, Sephiroth's feather in Cloud's hands shimmers in a purple hue and dissipates into particles of the same color. The color purple also exists in gameplay on the side of the characters. One thing we haven't seen or heard anybody mention is the purple light on weapon treasure chests. Sure, it signifies their special content, but what's the color of the lights on normal chests? Correct, yellow. Besides grenades or hazardous material, all items in yellow chests are of a supportive nature. Potions, remedies, bangles, accessories, everything which heals or protects. Weapons, on the other hand, are meant to inflict harm or cause destruction and are eventually used to combat the Whispers and defy fate, which is bad for the planet in its eyes, hence the color purple. They could have used colors other than yellow and purple for chess. Why not green and orange? Why even distinguish between weapon chess and the rest? It's too deliberate to be a mere coincidence and beautifully continues the established dichotomy. Purple is also used for particles of certain ability effects, like Cloud's Triple Slash, Tifa's Focus Strike, and the Limit Break Refocus, which is granted through a purple independent materia. Then we have Aerith's Sorceress Storm and her Tempest character ability. They all represent either an offensive and destructive force or enable a higher damage output. While Cloud and Tifa's abilities might just be coincidence, Refocused on Aerith's attacks certainly have meaning, especially the explosive purple crystals summoned by her Tempest attack. Refocus increases the action capacity by 50%, which is different than just manipulating ATB speed. Attacks like Maximum Fury even increase in effectiveness by using up to 3 instead of 2 ATB segments. And if you still think all of this is just a coincidence, what about the Armored Shock Trooper? It contains yellow lights on its armor, which protects the Enhanced Shock Trooper inside, and purple lights on its weapon. In intermission, the stronger and more deadly version, called Armored Magitrooper, bears only purple lights. Of course, those colors can merely be a visual design choice and doesn't necessarily connect to plot and story. Nonetheless, too many fitting examples exist across the board to write off the significance of those two colors. Why is Sephiroth so obsessed with Cloud? 
Cloud was the one who achieved the unthinkable. He essentially defeated Sephiroth while being a mere infantryman. With this, however, he unintentionally laid the groundwork for Sephiroth's future. Sephiroth died, yes, but his body and Genova's head traveled the life stream and ended up at the northern crater where he began to reconstitute his body. He also gained a lot of knowledge from the life stream. This is what kickstarted his plan to absorb the life stream, become a god, and reshape the planet's future. The combination of hatred and admiration towards Cloud made him a great target in Sephiroth's plan. Hojo's experimentation also helped as Cloud is now prone to manipulations through Genova cells. At the end of the original game, Cloud defeats Sephiroth again, together with his allies, but also alone in their spirit battle. To not fade into oblivion, Sephiroth reached out and made Cloud's memories of him his spirit core his anchor. Sephiroth tried to succeed a third time by using Geostigma, essentially corrupted negative life stream, to remind everyone, especially Cloud, that he still exists. Using those memories, his remnants and eventually the remains of Genova's head, he returned to the planet's surface to finally reach his goal choking and corroding the planet with negative life stream before traveling the cosmos with the planet as his vessel to inhabit a new planet just like Genova did before him. Alas, Cloud manages to defeat him once again, not even providing Sephiroth the satisfaction of giving him despair. After all of their adversarial encounters, losing to Cloud over and over and over again, despite being the more powerful entity, they share a very special and tight but unhealthy bond. The question is, how was Cloud even able to stand up to Sephiroth and thwart his plans over and over? The first time during the Nibelheim incident, the most rational explanation is a combination of Sephiroth's unpreparedness, hubris, and underestimation of Cloud. Being impaled seemed to have filled up Cloud's limit gauge, and paired with his hatred for Sephiroth made Cloud capable of standing up to him, similar to mothers seeing their child in mortal danger. At the end of both the original story and Advent Children, Cloud defeats Sephiroth using his ultimate limit break. Cloud's limit break, paired with strong emotions, seems like a force to be reckoned with. Furthermore, Cloud seems to cheat death over and over and over and over again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> Thus, their social bond and Cloud's continued resilience happen to be the only tools for Sephiroth to change his destiny where he's bound to lose. To overcome those bounds, he needs a different approach. What is Sephiroth's ultimate goal, and how does he try to achieve it? Based on the previous section, is it even possible to escape or defy one's destiny? In our previous analysis about Aerith's secrets, we propose that the main chain of events will remain, even with fate seemingly overcome. Why? The planets will in the still existing framework, especially the latter. A few things have changed, yes, but the story, the characters, their motivations, and backstories have largely remained intact, providing a very similar starting position for their journey. Imagine a rigid framework with a lot of free room in between. Fixed points in the story that need to remain in order to retain a stable future and ensure our main player's pursuit of their goals. Anything can happen between those fixed points as long as the events in between lead to said fixed point. But what does this mean for our main players? Aerith seems to secretly wish for a different future for her. One where she doesn't need to die at the altar in the Forgotten Capital. One where she can eventually live a normal life with her friends. Still, she knows that this dream will remain just that. She needs to stop Sephiroth and Genova and save the planet. That's her calling as the last Cetra. Sephiroth 
trying to resist destiny multiple times, but failed every time. Which leads him to go back and change past memories, to load a previous save state and try a different approach, so to speak. As discussed earlier in this analysis, we witness Sephiroth attempting to change the flow of the story multiple times. By appearing to Cloud in Sector 8, Sephiroth seems to try and divert him away from his original path and make him miss Aerith, as well as miss the train where he would meet up again with Avalanche. With regaining control over Cloud and his hatred towards his nemesis, Sephiroth would be able to guide Cloud on his journey to the Northern Crater on Sephiroth's own terms, without anybody interfering. However, Cloud still met Aerith and regrouped with Avalanche and Tifa, then, Sephiroth tried to prevent Cloud from joining them on the second bombing mission, after which he'd meet up again with Aerith. And there on out, Sephiroth's interventions remain minimal and focus on messing with Cloud's head and self-worth. Sephiroth's initial plan seems to have revolved around ejecting Aerith and Tifa from the equation. Aerith, the only one able to summon Holy, communicate with the planet, and alleviate Cloud's hatred. Tifa the one and only key to unlocking Cloud's real past, and with it, locking the door for Sephiroth. Thanks to the planet's intervention, the original chain of events in Midgar, and thus everyone's destiny, and the original framework remain intact, which provides a very similar starting point for the unknown future. Cloud and friends still pursue Sephiroth. Cloud is still prone to manipulations, and Sephiroth's takeover until he regains his true identity. Sephiroth still needs to get a hold of the Black Materia, and have Cloud be the one to deliver it. To break Cloud and bring him over to his side, Sephiroth still needs to separate him from his friends, and make Cloud believe that the only way to defy their destiny is to join him, Sephiroth. Otherwise, it will be Cloud who defeats him yet again. Their confrontation at the edge of creation showed him that Cloud is not ready yet. He's still too cautious and attached to his friends. Aerith still needs to summon Holy to counteract Sephiroth's actions, a preventative measure before he manages to summon Meteor. This in turn forces Sephiroth to step in and get rid of her. However, in order to stoke the flames of hatred, especially in Cloud, and to keep their pursuit going to make Cloud deliver the Black Materia to him as described before, he has to wait until the others arrive. Unless he finds a way to make them arrive before Aerith can summon Holy, she'll have already done so by the time the party arrives, keeping the original story intact. Additionally, if Sephiroth then tries to suppress the effects of Holy, which is crucial to not endanger his plan, Aerith has to join the livestream to ask the planet to help repel Meteor, basically sealing her fate. Lastly, Sephiroth still needs to summon Meteor to cause a wound big enough to absorb the livestream and eventually travel the cosmos. And then there's that game's logo, which still contains Meteor. <laughs> However, for the whole Final Fantasy VII compilation to finally reach an end, there needs to be more to Sephiroth's plans and his endgame which is what we're going to cover in the last part of this analysis. And with that, we conclude this segment of the journey through Clouds and Sephiroth's mysteries. Thank you so much for watching! If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe and select all notifications to be immediately notified when the next part of this analysis releases. Have you noticed anything we didn't? disagree on some points or have any other feedback for us, please let us know in the comments, or better yet, check out our Discord server and right away in the Observatory channel. We also release additional content on Twitter, like Viz's infamous CCO gems, so follow us there as well if you're so inclined. Furthermore, huge thanks to all our Patreon supporters. Your contribution is invaluable. You guys are the best. Stay safe and take care. Kudakuma, signing off. Bye.